Today on All About Canadian Books, we're going to find out how Italy inspires author Bernadine and Therese Stapleton. But before we do, please subscribe to my channel so you can keep up to date with the latest author interviews and the stories behind their books. Hi, my name is Crystal Fletcher. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Today's guest is Bernadine Ann Therese Stapleton. Bernadine is an award-winning playwright whose plays are, are produced nationally and internationally. She has written four books in short fiction and is a performer of unique distinction. She has served as a writer in residence at Memorial University, as a playwright in residence with several national companies, and as artistic director of theater festivals. And we'll be chatting about her latest novel, Love Life, which was published by Breakwater Books. Do you love life? In this hilarious frolic through the hills of Italy, our heroine discovers the past is never really gone. It runs beside us our entire lives, just waiting to bite us in the arse. <laughs> Love Life is a made up true fable about coming out, going back in, getting fat, Italian food, and stalking the Piazzo Berendini. It's a haunting love story transcending decades, countries, and heartbreak. And Newfoundlander in Italy offers the humor, optimism, and romantic yearning the world needs now. And it certainly does. I loved it. Welcome to All About Canadian Books, Bernadine. Oh, thank you. Thank you for all those beautiful words. I think that everybody should have the privilege of hearing their bio read out loud to them. It's so empowering. I know. And I, I'm like, wow, Bernadine has done a lot. And Bernadine, I have to ask you, a performer of unique distinction. What does this mean? Um, well, it's it's interesting that uh, that that particular sentence is in my bio. It was written for me uh, by somebody who actually was my manager some years ago, but no longer is. Um, but uh, I think because I was working in uh, classical theater for a long time, yes. and then I made a huge sidestep and went into political collective sketch comedy <laughs> and went from doing um, Ophelia to doing crazy comedy on stage. And yeah. ultimately, even though I'm very, very shy, uh, became known for being a comedian here in Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, I always say that I'm not really naturally funny, but I think I write funny. You do. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Definitely. And also, uh, Bernadine, on your website, you refer, refer to yourself as a writer of things like plays, books, blogs, like all the way to grant applications, speeches, yeah. tributes. Like if you had to choose, if you could only write one thing, one in one medium, what would you write? You know, uh, coming through the pandemic I really have discovered that I know it sounds cliche I really want to live by the water anywhere in the world mm -hmm. and I'm lucky to live in Newfoundland yes. uh, but I, I basically just want to write books yeah and I would love to write I, I would continue to write plays but I'm less and less interested in being on the stage and being in the public eye I find a great source of comfort in putting words down on the page and I think you know what I mean Yes, yes. Now, you refer to love life as a love letter to Italy. Yeah. What is it about Italy that you love so much? I don't know why that a Newfoundlander would connect so deeply with this country. Um, but I was there when I began the book. 
I was there on a yoga retreat with Nova Yoga, which is a worldwide uh, yoga retreat organization based here in St. John's, Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. And we all assembled in uh, Luca, which is in the Tuscany region. Mm -hmm. And we were there with some other Newfoundlanders and Canadians, Uh, but the Newfoundland Italian connection came very strongly, very quickly. I think because there's a strong sense of family and instant family food for sure. Lots of food culture. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we went from the jigs dinner to the pasta. That transition mm-hmm. was delightful. Uh, music, theater, all of those mm-hmm. things seemed that bubbled to the surface. Uh, mm-hmm. Crazy road systems and bad driving. <laughs> and even though I, you know, we could transcend language. Mm-hmm. I find in Newfoundland where storytellers and Italians are storytellers, everything yes. is very demonstrative. Everything yes. is larger than life. <laughs> yes. It was all of those things. And um, so I began writing about uh, my time there because when I was growing up, I had a childhood friend mm-hmm. and we had fallen in love with this statue. There's a very rare priceless Mm -hmm. Italian uh, sculpture in the presentation convent here in St. John's. You can knock on the door of the convent and the nuns will let you in to see it. That's the way it is. It's called the veil of the Virgin. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's Mm -hmm. by a a little known sculpture now named Strazza, although at the time he was very well known. Now inexplicably this statue was um, made and shipped over by sea to St. John's, Newfoundland, and nobody knows about it. (laughs) It is the worth of it. I don't know. They know now. (laughs) Now they know. I hope nobody comes and sneaks in that convent and steals it. (laughs) My best friend and I fell in love with this statue, and we would go visit it all the time, and we had a childhood pact that we were going to go to Italy because there was a rumor that Strazza had actually made two two identical virgins. And the reason the statue is so uh, interesting is because w- however he did it, there's the veil over the face is, all, is also sculpted, but you see beneath the veil. So you see the mm-hmm. face of the virgin beneath the veil. And if you stare at it long enough, you know, you can almost see her breath whispering in and out. And oh. So we were gonna go to Italy and find the other veiled virgin my friend whom I call in the book Pittman unfortunately passed away Mm -hmm. uh, before she was 30 um, with cancer so all of those things were sort of pulsing through my blood when I was there so I began my journal this record of my trip there as kind of a salutation to her and doing all the things that she would never get to do oh that's beautiful what a lovely tribute Thank you. And when you started writing Bernadine, did you find it a really therapeutic process in grieving your friend? (sighs) Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Sorry. It was. Oh, don't be sorry. (laughs) Sorry. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry because. Yeah. You know, the state of the world we're in these days, it's like all our emotions are really heightened. And, you know, the thing about the trip was it was a beautiful testament to the dreams that she and I had, but it was also a huge celebration as well. And I didn't know at the time when I was making the book that she was going to be such a big part of it. But when I got back and began assembling all my material, it seemed that that was going to be a through line through all the humor Mm -hmm. and frolicking and romping. And also at the time, which I'm very candid about in the book, you know, I've had a real struggle in my life with body image Mm -hmm. and frankly, who hasn't? Mm -hmm. And so I put a a lot of that into the book as well, because, you know, if you go to Italy, you look at all the statues, they're not counting their carbohydrates. They're beautiful. They're lush. They're fabulous. They're, Mm -hmm. you know, the women of Italy are, are uh, you know Italians love bodies they love yes. age they love older women yes. they you know they love to see you eat 
<laughs> and so I fell into that culture as well, which is a culture of, of what beauty really is and, you know, what we perceive it to be. And I actually say in my book that if you're a woman of a certain age, go to Italy and, you know, <laughs> they'll fall in love with you as you're plucking out your chin hair and you'll get marriage proposals galore. And it was, you know, so I had a lot of fun exploring that as well and yeah. um, kind of relaxing into the best garment we'll ever wear is our own skin. You know, it's yeah. like, this is it. And you and I were chatting a little bit before we began about clothing and going yes. through our closets yes. and things like that, you know, and it's such a, such a ritual, but mm -hmm. if we could bestow that kind of attention on ourselves, I think it would be a very interesting process. Yeah. And I, I really love that part of your book. Like I, I feel like I should be underlining it because it is such an important message and um yeah like to, to love yourself <laughs> well yeah and the title came from uh, a little monologue that I had been toying with because I used to have a friend we're not so close anymore but I've been I was single for a long time and uh every time I met this particular friend she would say how's your love life are you seeing anybody <laughs> How's your love life? And it got to be, it caused me so anxiety because the answer was always, I don't have anybody, nobody loves me. I'm gonna be single forever. And it was my, cause you know, I never had an adequate response that would make yeah. her happy. And, yeah. and then I wrote this line, the single line, I keep, everybody wants to know about my love life. I keep waiting for someone to ask me, do you love life? Yes. Maybe the best line I've ever written in my, in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And then it felt like that was going to be the perfect title for the book. It, it was, it really, I, I, it summed it up, sums it up beautifully, doesn't it? On oh, so yes. many levels, so many levels. Now, Bernadine, I giggled and teeheed my way through your book. Um, you've got a, like a great sense of humor. Um, when you were writing, um, did you like you you do as you were saying you do cover some heavier subjects that in in your book um so and i'm and i am so appreciative that you were still able to use your incredible wit w was that hard to do at times no i love humor yeah i just love humor i love smiling i love laughter it's what yeah. it's what is keeping us going yes and um so i was able also to approach everything with an irreverence mm -hmm. that i just loved you know i write about the fact that a newfoundlander in italy can never find her way around <laughs> that the very things you're looking for seem to disappear the closer you get to them mm -hmm that Italians are fearsome in the way that Panthers are just before they eat you. <laughs> Everybody smokes. Yeah. I, I remember going into a little store and saying to this woman, do you speak English? And she went, no, <laughs> I don't speak no English and in perfect English. <laughs> yeah. And I was like a deer in headlights the whole time and um the food of course you have to write about oh yeah the food you know i write that the food is so fresh it would slap you in the face you know and <laughs> yeah, know. the only reason you stop eating is because you have to start eating again at some point yeah so you yeah. have to you have to to make some room but i i can tell i think any story can be told with humor and respect mm -hmm. and love and reverence and my humor never comes out of um any kind of antagonistic approach to yeah. the subject or to people if there if there's anything i can be disparaging about myself mm -hmm. and i do uh make the comparison that you know before i left i was actually struggling a lot with uh standing in my closet feeling like i had nothing to wear you know surrounded mm -hmm. by clothing with nothing to wear and mm -hmm. the pressure that i was putting on myself to look pretty to look younger to lose weight mm -hmm. And it was really getting in the way of, of my life. Yeah. You know, it was, it was a barrier that was pre preventing me from real, from hearing my, from hearing my bio. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was, I was putting all these things in my way. And once I allowed all that to fall away, uh, you know, I said like, um, 
Uh, so before I went, I gave away the size five dress I knew I was never going to wear again. And that yeah. dress didn't cry because it, that dress doesn't care about me, <laughs> you know, and, and that dress does not care about me. And, um, you know, the feeling of euphoria about getting on the plane and going and then getting off in a country, which is su such, you know, such uh, wealth of history and culture. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And uh crazy road systems that you could never figure out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, Bernadine, your novel, it made me hungry and it made, uh, me, and it made me laugh. And uh, would you say it's safe to say that uh, Bernadine loves life right now in this moment? Love it so fully. So yeah. fully. I'm sending you the hugest, <laughs> lovingest hug. Thank you. I'll take it. The world. <laughs> All the way from Newfoundland. Oh, I'll take it all the way in Ontario. Now, Bernadine, you are involved in a really interesting initiative called Girl Power. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about this initiative? Oh, I would love to. And thanks so much for asking me about that. So uh, a long time ago, actually 20 years ago, I formed a little company called Girl Power. Mm -hmm. And um, my work with Girl Power is to tell female or female identified driven stories. And uh, some of what I do is taking existing fairy tale tropes or myths and turning them on their head. So for example, one of the first plays I did for young girls uh, is called Ophelia Swims. Mm. And it takes, for example, it takes the story, the tragedy of Ophelia uh, in Hamlet and where she has an unfortunate ending in a stream and it empowers her to swim and take uh -huh. control of her own story yeah. so all all of these stories and fairy tales where the main character is portrayed as helpless and needs a prince yeah. to rescue them uh mm -hmm. is sort of i turn it around so that they take control of their own stories for example I took uh, the story of Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, where they actually sing a song about how these these fairy tales represent terrible things. Yeah, you know, yeah. Sleeping Beauty did not give permission to that prince to kiss her. Yeah. You know, so he yeah. shouldn't have been at that. And uh, you know, Rapunzel had every right to her own hair, mm -hmm. and. Um, and uh, so that is what I've been doing. And um, I'm now working on a, on a new adaptation of Ophelia Swims because the first version was written 20 years ago. Yeah. And I'm updating it a little bit for a slightly older, but still young adult audience. Oh, that's fabulous. I love it. Like, I just love it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, Bernadine and Therese Stapleton, what is your number one writing tip for writers? Well, um, there's a reason that I'm sitting up in my bed right now, because uh, <laughs> I actually have my computer on my little bed tray. I, I, I open my eyes and I write. I put it first in my day. That's what works for me. Mm -hmm. And I will show up. Uh, whether I feel I have anything to deliver or offer or not. So mm -hmm. sometimes I have struggled with where am I going to put the time? What, how will I sandwich it in? And so what I decided to do is I greet my day with it. Mm -hmm. And it does mean that I wake up a little earlier than maybe a lot of other people. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't mind that. It's a very, very special time when the world is waking up. Yeah. And yeah. it feels like it wakes up your soul in a very, in a very interesting way. Mm -hmm. And the day hasn't had a chance to wear you down yet. You know, if you're struggling yeah. with anything or yeah. you have chores to do, it's sort of like in the early morning hours, there's an inhale. Mm -hmm. Everything is, everything is. <gasps> yeah. And that's when I get all my words out. Oh, I like that. That's great. I hope it works. <laughs> yeah, I hope it serves. Now, um, may you, can you please read, uh, just give us a little excerpt of your novel, Love Life. But before you read, um, Bernadine, could you let us know why you've chosen this particular section to read? Um, uh, okay, I'm going to read a little section for you that is about uh, one of my first 
days in Lucca Mm. and an exploration that I began because when I first arrived I thought it was very auspicious that on a map my name is Bernardine and on a map I found that there was a piazza Bernardini yeah yeah I thought <laughs> I didn't know it's a very very common brand name and you know I had no idea where it came from I felt it was exclusively for me so this is a section for when I first embark yeah. On my hunt. Okay. Stalking the Piazza Bernardini. I'm flushed with excitement, plump and sweating inside my yellow dress. I stole it from a theater costume bank, believing it would give me an air of intrigue. It's retro and sleeveless. Going sleeveless is a big step for me. I've spent years hating my upper arms. The dress is gauzy and long, with swirls that look like pretty female faces. I wish I'd worn a slip because the back of the dress keeps crawling up my butt crack. I keep pulling it down in what I hope are surreptitious moves, but it probably looks exactly like what it is, picking my dress out of my butt. I know in my heart that when I find my perfect Italian dress, I'll be able to walk everywhere without once having to pick at my butt. <laughs> also, it will not bunch around my waist like I'm pregnant. Neither will I sweat. I'm clutching a soggy map of the center of Luca. I've studied it inside and out, upside down, right side up. I've drawn the way to the Piazza Bernardini in blue pen. Easy peasy. Standing on the corner of Paplina and Bortomachia is a short, handsome, very old man. He's older than poetry. He's weeping while gazing at a selection of ties on display in a designer's store window. He rocks back and forth on his feet. His tears form rivers that run down the crevasses of his face. They cascade to the cobblestones beneath our feet, puddles of tears that the rest of us step over in annoyance. He's dressed to the nines and tens and elevens, Ralph Lauren from head on to toe. He's wearing a fedora with a red feather. His long white hair brushes his collar. He's wearing a pocket watch on a silver chain and checks it obsessively in between sobs. I stare at him for a long while before I take his picture. I also hope this is surreptitious, but it isn't. I move on, letting the sea of people carry me, meandering. Fellow yogis wave from a table on the sidewalk, holding containers of colorful gelato. I wave, but crest along, secure in knowing I simply have to follow the narrow cobblestone path directly to the Piazza Bernardini. What would it be like, this piazza? Most likely very charming. I envision a riotous garden with a cherub peeing daintily into an alabaster fountain. <laughs> Old ladies clad in black, smoking as they catcall the handsome young men in tight t-shirts and tighter black pants. Benches where Italian cats lays in the afternoon after torturing Italian mice. <laughs> Thank you. I can picture it so perfectly from, you know, pulling the dress out of the butt crack. <laughs> Like it just it's so perfect thank you so uh, much. the harder i tried to be elegant the less elegant i was i'm sure uh we women in sundresses can all relate to that all um relate. and ultimately i think uh, i hope people will read the book and you will discover that i did find my piazza yeah at the end yes 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 so i highly recommend love life it is the perfect book for a giggle and just with a lot of important messages woven through as well and what i will do bernadine is i'll put links down below in the description box to your website and also to breakwater's website so our viewers can purchase a copy of love life well, I wish you and all your viewers and fans the very best. And I hope that there's all kinds of love in your life. Thank you so much. And thank you for being such a fantastic guest. And I had a ball. Oh, I did too. Yes. And I'm sure the viewers did as well. And everyone, please come back next week. <laughs> thank you for watching.